And these people who domesticated plants and animals uh, are the Canaanites, and, uh, and this happened about 12,000 years ago. That's why Jericho is the oldest continuously inhabited town on Earth, by the way. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. The Struggle is on over 30 cable stations from Maine to New York City and points west. We start with a demonstration in Beirut, Lebanon, which expresses support for many movements against corruption, tyranny, and apartheid. It ends with down with Israel. That's not our slogan, but we do firmly oppose Israeli apartheid and strongly support efforts for Palestinian freedom, along with solidarity with all the other movements. We've talked about the terrible treatment Muslims in India are receiving at the orders of the president, the Hindu supremacist Modi. There's going to be a big demonstration on the 26th. That's Sunday in New York City, 5th Avenue and 64th Street, near the Consulate of India on India Republic Day. We have mentioned that the Iraqi parliament and prime minister have called for U.S. troops and contractors to get out of Iraq. The Iraqi president, Barham Saleh, said so point-blank to Trump at Davos. This echoes in part a demand by the Iraq protesters, the people who have been in the streets for the last several months, their demand that both U.S. and Iranian forces get out and leave Iraq alone. They say this, they continue to say this, even though Iraqi security people have killed over 500 protesters. Today, January 24th, it was an immense rally called by the Muslim cleric Muqadda Sadr calling for U.S. troops to go home. Is there any doubt that that's what the Iraqi people want? Is there any reason for U.S. troops to stay in Iraq? 50 world leaders joined Benjamin Netanyahu in Jerusalem for the World Holocaust Forum, or perhaps it should have been called the World Hypocrisy Forum, because many of those heads of state were engaging in massive human rights violations and killings. It was held to celebrate the liberation of the Auschwitz concentration camp 75 years ago. Certainly, 
the liberation of that camp by the first Ukrainian front of the Soviet army is indeed something that should be celebrated, but not by Netanyahu, Pence, and Putin in the capital of apartheid. Now, about the death camp itself, something the world media is barely talking about. The question of why the Allies didn't bomb Auschwitz to, into oblivion. As early as May 1944, Allied bombers were in range of the death camp. But as former Supreme Court Justice Arthur Goldberg, who in the 40s was part of the U.S. Strategic Services, he wrote that the Allies were indifferent to the plight of the Jews. And Jewish leaders in the United States hardly made an issue of it. Top leaders like Rabbi Stephen Wise rejected any effort to save European Jews unless it was tied to bringing them to British Palestine. As dissenter Peter Bergson said at the time, it was as if people were in a burning house screaming for help and rescue would only be attempted if it was agreed upon that the fire victims would be brought immediately to the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. I write about the non-bombing of Auschwitz in my book, Zionist Betrayal of Jews. Now to the Schaefer Lecture of Promoting Enduring Peace. We'll have the first part of it today. It was delivered by Dr. Mazen Kumsia, the director of the Palestine Museum of Natural History in occupied Bethlehem. He's a longtime activist for Palestinian rights. He's spoken practically all over the world for the cause. Thank you Thanks for coming uh, on this cold weather. Uh, about a year ago, I received an email uh, from Obeya Boudi, uh, who said, uh, you're a recognized scientist in Palestine. I've been on your email list for a long time, and I would like to invite you to a meeting called Scientists for Palestine uh, at MIT. And uh, that's the main reason why I came to the US at this time. And of course, I accepted the invitation. It's an opportunity after especially learning more about uh, this meeting and the idea behind it, and that there's going to be even Nobel Prize winners at this meeting. And it's a gathering of concerned scientists who want to bring human rights and justice uh, to Palestine. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Obai, who is uh, the executive director of the Bissan Center for Research in Ramallah, who was organizing this meeting, was arrested uh, November 13 when uh, Israeli soldiers came to his house at 3 in the morning and kidnapped him, basically. And he's been held uh, hardly without any contacts with anybody. His wife, I think, saw him one time only. And he's been mistreated, and we demand his release. And in the end, hopefully, uh, we can have a, we, uh, Stan kindly made the banner uh, for his release, and maybe we can all pose with the picture of the banner, um, with the, our picture with the banner, so that we can release him. Amnesty International released, uh, basically, a release about him asking for his release as a political detainee. Anyways, um, so I do want to say something about this meeting of scientists for Palestine that was held. And you can see the, the uh, banners for it. Uh, at MIT, MIT is where my son was uh, graduated from, as some of you may know. Did his bachelor and master degree, so it, uh, I used to go up there frequently. Uh, MIT is famous for a lot of research. Some of it has to do with military, unfortunately. And my son refused to participate in any research that's connected to the military when he was at MIT. Science can be used for both good things and bad things, as you can imagine. And now with the 
you know, <coughs> basically everything we say, even what we are talking about here, is being recorded and listened to in Tel Aviv. So, <laughs> uh, and Washington, probably, Virginia, and other places. Um, so we have invasion of privacy. We have, uh, we have a system that's stacked against us that uses scientific technology and knowledge. Um, but we can also use science uh, for good things. This is Mahatma Gandhi looking through a microscope. Uh, um, my own scientific background, I don't know if you know, has involved research at places like Duke University and Yale University, uh, publishing research at um, cutting edge in genetics and medical genetics. For example, I was the first scientist to explain why um, different uh, species have different chromosome numbers. Why do humans have 46 chromosomes, etc. And um, I was the first to explain how chromosome abnormalities lead to spontaneous abortion and why uh, children with Down syndrome have mental retardation. It has little to do with the, uh, three copies instead of two copies of a gene, as was believed before. I also did some key environmental work in Palestine before I came to the U.S. and after I came to the U.S. And now our institute does research in various fields, and, uh, but they all pour down the issue of sustainability. How do we sustain human life and environment at the same time in Palestine, even under colonial occupation? Now, uh, very briefly, for those of you who didn't hear me in the past, I do want to quickly go over uh, this uh, patient history, patient diagnosis, therapy, and prognosis for the situation in Palestine. Um, Palestine, of course, is part of the Fertile Crescent, where our ancestors, and I say our because it's also your ancestors, because as you know, we all came out of Africa before we went to Europe and the rest of the world. So our collective ancestors, the Canaanites, and uh, developed agriculture, domesticated plants and animals. And these people who domesticated plants and animals uh, are the Canaanites, and, uh, and this happened about 12,000 years ago. That's why Jericho is the oldest continuously inhabited town on Earth, by the way. Uh, Palestine is also not just important for uh, human migration, it was important for animal migration and remains so to this day that uh, birds, unfortunate for the politicians, they cannot stop birds from flying. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the borders, this idea of borders, I don't know whoever came up with it, it's silly. But anyways, uh, birds migrate from Eurasia to Africa every year, 500 million birds pass through our country. And these are the people of this country. These are the native Palestinians and this museum, and I am really grateful for our host, Faisal, who started this museum on his own, with his own money, um, sort of like I also started the museum in Palestine with, with my own money and, and, so, and resources. But it highlights this history, and it's, you know, for the mythology of a land without a people, for a people without a land, Museums like this are really essential. They are critical for showing that indeed there were people and there were cultures long before uh, such stupid ideas like Zionism came about in the late 19th century. This is a picture of my great grandmother actually walking down the steps of the old house in Beit Sahur in the shepherd's field where the shepherds heard the angels sing, went up to Bethlehem. Uh, one of those kids on the right is my grandfather, and the house is still there. It has been built a few hundred years ago. And uh, we have been in living there and breathing there and doing things there, you know, for thousands of years without any problems, by the way. This patient is not always sick, so to speak. <laughs> Palestine has been very peaceful, very, very few conflicts. And this piece also allows innovation and creativity, uh, like the creation of the alphabet that you use today. The ABCs come from us, from the Aramaic. The same as the Arabic alphabet, by the way, comes 
from Proto-Aramaic. So our students research these things and we tell them about these things. Now we do have a problem here and you know it. Uh, I don't want to make this a political lecture. I, I didn't uh, want to do that. Uh, we do have a problem that's related to an idea called Zionism which was adopted by the British and the French empires who actually left us a legacy of borders and stupidities and dividing countries like Syria and Lebanon, Iraq and Palestine, Jordan. All of these divisions were done by Sykes-Pico Agreement, London and Paris basically. And then followed immediately after by the Balfour and Jules Cambon declarations in support of this, again, stupid idea called Zionism. Um, but this conflict, even if you take it as 100 or 120 years, is a very small percentage of our history of, again, 12,000 years of civilization. And the conflict before it, you'd have to go back to the Crusaders to find this conflict. Uh, another conflict. Both of these, by the way, came to us from Europe. So, no thanks to Europe for our problems. <laughs> but, um, but the result of this was very obvious, which is to take this very rich, beautiful culture that lasted in harmony with nature for over 12,000 years of civilization and destroy it and destroy all these Palestinian villages and towns. 530 of them, as you see, on the map there that were destroyed, um, the red dots on that map, to create the so-called Jewish State of Israel. I, uh, I say so-called because I don't really believe that Zionism has anything to do with Judaism or Jewishness. And Stern has published a very nice book about the collaboration of the Zionists with anti-Semites. And also Lenny Brenner here has done some earlier books that inspired Stan and inspired me for some of our work. But anyway, the bottom line is there was ethnic cleansing of these villages. And um, today, seven and a half million of us Palestinians are refugees or displaced people, including the family of Yusuf that you heard about. Now, there's a website called Visualizing Palestine. Here again, where technology and science can work positive things and can work negative things, I think this is a positive use of technology and knowledge, is to visualize with graphics what had happened in Palestine. As you can see here how, uh, for example, since the occupation of uh, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip in 1967, there has been demolishing of Palestinian homes at the bottom and on the top, the built up of Jewish only colonies or homes. And this is about the demographic changes and basically the removal of Palestinians. And by the way, the first removal of Palestinians, first Palestinian refugees was not in 1948 when the state of Israel was created, it started in the 1920s under the British rule and the control of people like Herbert Samuels, uh, Zionist leader of Palestine in the 1920s, appointed by the British. But the bottom line is 3.8 almost million uh, Jewish immigrants came to us from around the world, and 1.7 million Palestinians were removed, and of course their children and grandchildren, that's what accounts for the fact that, as I mentioned, 7.5 million of us are refugees or displaced people. Palestinians are relegated to small Bantustans, ghettos in the Galilee, in the West Bank, and in the Negev, and in the Gaza Strip, uh, where Yusuf comes from. And these ghettos uh, all together account for 8.3% of the historic land of Palestine. In South Africa, under apartheid, the blacks were relegated to 11.5% of the land, so we're actually worse than apartheid in South Africa. When my son was 13 years old, he saw the shrinking map of the US at the bottom, and it gave him the idea to draw the shrinking map of Palestine in 1998, and this has been used by many people, including now visualizing Palestine came up with this uh, even more brilliant idea of showing how uh, Jewish colonies have replaced Palestinian communities the gray dots on the map on the left in 1882 is basically the um, 
Palestinian villages and towns and their uh, ownership of the land. And uh, as you see, slowly more and more Jewish colonies in uh, blue. And today, you know, the gray is almost gone and there's, the Zionists want it all gone, of course. This is the diagnosis of settler colonialism, of course, and so it's important to make this diagnosis as settler colonialism. Settler colonialism also affects the environment. For example, draining of the wetland, of the Hula reserves uh, that destroyed 119 species, the uprooting of all these Palestinian villages and their associated trees and landscape, and then planting a monoculture of European pine trees to replace them is another mega project that the Zionists have engaged in, a diversion of the Jordan Valley water uh, from Lake Tiberias that dried up the Jordan Valley and resulted in the shrinking of the Dead Sea is another mega project. And there's even Israeli author Alan Tal who wrote a book called Pollution in the Promised Land an environment and history of Israel. <laughs> I think it's remarkable. Uh, but anyways, uh, now that the Dead Sea is shrinking, Israel is also building a canal uh, between the Red Sea and the Dead Sea that will uh, destroy the Wadi Araba and destroy the coral reefs of the Aqaba area, or Ilat, as they now call that uh, town there. Um, and this is very devastating environmentally. Basically, they'll pump the water up, desalinate it, pump it down. The sludge, basically, what's left of the desalination will be dumped into the Dead Sea. Very, very catastrophic project. Cost $20 billion. And the reason it's put on the Jordanian side is that Jordan will be left holding the bag for this very useless uh, and totally destructive environment, a very useless economically, totally destructive uh, project. Because that's how the World Bank and the IMF work, by the way, to put the other countries in, under their thumb, is they give them large amounts of money for projects they don't really need, and then they can control their economies and make sure that Jordan will always be subservient to the U.S. and votes with it. This is Jabal Abu Naim near my village of Beit Sahur, which what it used to look like in 1997 on the top, and what it looks like now today uh, is a basically a concrete jungle. That's another environmentally catastrophic project. These are symptoms, I would say, and what uh, Yusuf also talked about are symptoms of settler colonialism. What's the output of uh, our outcome of settler colonialism? It's one of three models, either the Algerian model, where 1.5 million natives were killed, 1 million French left. Many of them have never seen France in their lives. They were six, seven generations in Algeria. Um, the second model is the Australian USA model, where there's genocide of the native people. Both model one and model two are rare. Model 3 is the most frequent model, and it involves basically the descendants of the colonizers and the descendants of the colonized living in one country. That's found in places like uh, South America, like Brazil, Argentina, Chile, other places. Also Central America, like uh, Colombia and Panama and so forth, and North America, like Mexico and Canada. And also, you know, Southeast Asia, Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, Taiwan, all these countries. Taiwan, by the way, is where my wife is from. And she is a descendant not of the native people of Taiwan. She is descendant of the colonizers of Taiwan. Okay, what happens in those countries? People live together. It's not kumbaya, by the way. It's not happiness, <laughs> wonderful life, but it's at least less bloody than scenario number one and scenario number two. And we Palestinians have always pushed for scenario number three. As you know, we also uh, try to follow or emulate what happened in South Africa because it's the most recent event of a slight starting decolonization process. At the start of his lecture, Dr. Kumsia spoke about the plight of Ubay Abudi, at the end of the event at the Palestine Museum, a number of the members of the audience stood behind this banner 
calling for freedom for Ubay Abudi. More of Dr. Kumsia's talk next week. In West Haven, Connecticut, state troopers chased a suspect in an armed carjacking onto city streets. The car was boxed in by state and city police cars. A trooper and a local policeman approached the car and in a very brief time, the state trooper shot the suspect, Mubarak Soleimani, dead. This is video for a protest the next day in New Haven, the city where 19-year-old Soleimani lived. Justice for Mubarak! 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 your outpouring of support to our family. We are greatly, greatly appreciated. Um, our goal here today is to shed light on the fact that our family member needs justice. We are out here and our goal once again is for, you, uh, for all of you to understand that Mubarak was a human being. Justice for Mumi! Justice for Mumi! Justice for Mumi! Justice for movie. 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 That's our program for today. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller for the struggle.